it's 9 a.m. in Europe, and I think we can slowly start our first public lecture uh, in 2022. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to today's discussion, today's public lecture on the Quad and the future of US-led alliances in the Indo-Pacific. It seems that at today's uh, turbulent times, um, it is more than timely to uh, rethink the, the value of democratic alliances and their capacity to face some of the challenges posed by uh, revisionist powers. And uh, while the eyes of the international community are uh, obviously focused on the um, Eastern European theater, the Indo-Pacific, the, the broad uh, area covered by the Indo-Pacific uh, is of course home to many security hotspots that all have the potential in a way to overspill into a more serious uh, conflict, including in traditional conventional security terms as we could uh, see today. Um, over the last decade, uh, we have seen the emergence of, of various so-called minilateral formations, be it the Quad, uh, be it the AUKUS Security Partnership, that add to this pre-existing hub uh, of, of US-led uh, or US bilateral alliances. And the question is, of course, how do these interlink? How are they relevant? How do they complement each other? And are they really fit uh, for the purpose? Are they fit for the challenge? How do they actually uh, manage to respond to some of the uh, security challenges that we are facing? To help us delve into uh, this complex topic, I am more than uh, delighted to have uh, with me Professor Gordon Flake, who is the CEO of the Perth US Asia Center. Uh, Gordon is uh, what I call one of the true uh, Indo-Pacific experts uh, with not only an experience uh, in Asia, obviously, but over 25 years in Washington, uh, the US policy circles uh, in, in Australia, uh, but also of course, um, of course Asia. Uh, and he will uh, drive us through uh, this public lecture. Just the purpose of these lectures, contrary to a regular webinar, is really to go a little bit more in detail, while at the same time keeping uh, the format interactive enough to give uh, all of us the opportunity to ask questions and, and, and debate on some of the issues that uh, Gordon will raise. Housekeeping rules, uh, we have about 90 minutes. Uh, Gordon will speak for about half of the time, and then we will open the floor uh, for Q&As. Do not hesitate to uh, post your questions. If, you, if something comes to your mind immediately when Gordon speaks or afterwards, of course, uh, by raising your hands or in the q and um, box on the right of your screen. So without further ado, uh, Gordon, uh, it's my pleasure to, to have you here. Thank you so much for joining and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Petsova. It, it is a great honor. Um, Avan and I have spoken together on previous panels. I think the most one was virtually in New York, although she was there in Europe and I was here in Australia. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to be speaking today to this important program as part of the Brussels School of Governance Japan program. Um, and uh, very quickly, even without that very generous introduction by Dr. Petsova, I think you will quickly recognize that uh, there's a lot more Arizona in my accent than Australia. Um, I have been in Western Australia, in Perth, for about um, almost nine years now, just a little over eight eight years now. Uh, but as mentioned, I'm originally from the uh, United States. I spent 25 years in the foreign policy think tank community in Washington, D.C. before defecting to Perth, the farthest city on the planet on land away from Washington, D.C. Uh, and you will all be very familiar with the old adage that where you stand depends on where you sit. Uh, and you will not be surprised to know that my views on many of the issues that we are going to be discussing today have shifted quite dramatically as I went from literally one pole to the other, from Washington to its antipodes uh, to Western Australia. 
And part of that is because I'm obviously a lot closer to the region. I've, I've half joked, uh, at, at least prior to becoming an Australian citizen, I told people that I was the the physical manifestation of America's rebalance towards Asia, that I just figured that I would move here more quickly um, and be, be part of this region. Um, but if I give you a little bit more context, I spent most of, of, of the 25 years I was in Washington, D.C., working on Japan, Korea, and Northeast Asia. So my view of alliances was heavily informed by my experience comparing the U.S. alliance with South Korea and the U.S. alliance with Japan. And, and you, can, you can be guaranteed that both those two countries were constantly benchmarking each other. If there was a status of forces agreement or there was a burden sharing agreement, immediately one would know what the other had and that became a key part of their, their views. Uh, they're also really keenly aware of, of you know, simple things. Yesterday, many of you may be aware that the United States President Joe Biden just gave a, an annual State of the Union address. One of the games often played in Washington, D.C., not just by Koreans and Japanese, but almost all embassies, was a quick tally of whether or not their country got a mention in the State of Union, whether it was positive or negative. Um, and, and they were comparing how many mentions they got compared to the others in terms of that process. Uh, so that was kind of my view. Uh, that was what I view as alliance. I was aware, of course, that there were many other treaty allies. I had not focused much on NATO. I was an Asianist, uh, nor had I focused very much on Australia and, and, and New Zealand. Uh, I knew that the five eyes relationship, uh, as they call it, that five party you know, alliance essentially between the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, was was qualitatively different. But I always assumed in my mind that that was just because of language and culture and common heritage, right? You know, the, the much vaunted Anglosphere. And it really wasn't until I moved to Australia that I began to realize that the nature of the alliance cooperation between the United States and Japan was fundamentally different uh, than the relationship in the alliance between the United States and the Five Eyes countries, and in particular Australia. And part of that really comes down to two things. Number one, law. You know, that, that agreement was built on a legal framework for intelligence sharing uh, and for the, the ability to share intelligence within those circles. And there was a legal framework for that. And really, you know, Japan specialists like Dr. Petsova will know it was only just over a decade ago, maybe 15 years ago, that the, for the first time, the modern post-war Japanese government built a legal framework for classifying information, for determining what was classified and what was not. And, and that's a very important foundation for intelligence communities to work together. But because of that common framework for, of law, the, for, it also provided a common framework of intelligence. And so, as I think many of you may know, Australia has had a very important role in working together with the United States, in not only in the gathering, but the gathering, interpretation, utilization of intelligence. And so it has just led to a situation where uh, US and, and Australian officials tend to finish each other's sentences because they are, are so much in sync with knowing what's happening around the world because they're involved together in intelligence gathering and sharing, and they have the legal underpinning for such an agreement. And I think we saw that in, in spades this last week, and I'm gonna come back to this at the end of my remarks in how rapid uh, the Australian response uh, was to the developments in Ukraine. And I think you can go back for the last 30 years and you're gonna find that's gonna be almost the same in almost every instance you can think of. Now, having said that, um, I also gained an appreciation for how fundamentally different the relationship with the United States alliance with Japan and Korea were, primarily because they were much more on the front line, so to speak. Um, um, there in the Cold War in particular, uh, uh, but still in this case of, of the Korean Peninsula being the last instance where the Cold War has not been resolved. Um, there remains a very real frontline element about those relationships, which has meant that they, they are extremely substantive, both in terms of budgets, numbers of troops, uh, and actual planning. So whereas the, say, the Australian-US alliance as a treaty ally is very, very intimate, uh, highly collaborative, you, you know, you have, you know, Australian military officials, 
you know, in Hawaii, in the Indo-Pacific Command, commanding American soldiers, that level of integration, which is difficult to imagine in, say, Japan or Korea. At the same time, you know, if you look at budgets and numbers of troops and roles and responsibilities and training, you know, obviously Japan has a very different role. So as Dr. Petsova mentioned at the very beginning, we have spent the better part of both the Cold War and the post-Cold War era thinking about our alliances kind of as a hub and spoke, uh, and that the United States uh, had very important alliance relationships in Europe with individual countries, but more broadly with NATO. It also had key treaty allies in the Indo-Pacific. It had treaty allies in South Korea, in Japan, in Thailand, the Philippines, in Australia, and no longer the same with New Zealand, but had them as well, then also in the Americas as well, treaty allies. And so there was the hub and there was the spokes. Uh, that has been shifting and has actually been shifting quite rapidly. So I thought for today's lecture, what I would start with was what is changing in the world over the last decade? And in particular, given the focus of, of this amazing Japan program that Dr. Petsova and her colleagues have put together at, uh, at uh, the Brussels School of Governance, I thought I might look at it primarily through the prism of Japan. Uh, and to do that, I will note that for most of my professional career, Japan was a country that had to be coaxed to do something. That they were, they were post-Cold War, uh, extremely hesitant and tentative on the global scene. Uh, both the consequences of the end of World War II, the, the role of American military in, in, in governance until you know, post-occupation uh, you know, and then independence, not independence, that's the wrong world, self-governance, uh, then the treaty alliance that led to it. There, 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 was, there was a level of caution uh, that go to all the way up until the first Gulf War, you know, where again Japan's it, it role was was almost entirely uh, financial, uh, something for which rather than being praised, they were criticized. Uh, and since then, you've seen year upon year, uh, decade upon decade, Japan growing in its its confidence and its ability to project, its ability to be involved in the region. And part of that has been driven first and foremost by number one growing expectations of Japan, because the environment's there, but two very important meta trends that I'm going to spend a lot of time on during the course of my remarks. The first of those trends is the rise of China. There's no way around it. We can talk about lots of other things, but the most important factor in Japan's increasingly confident, robust, and proactive international presence and I'll talk about lots of different fora, has been the growth of China. And not just the growth of China, because it really isn't the growth of China that's a problem. It really has been China's increasing challenge to what we in Australia would call the rules-based order. Um, and the more that China has begun to frame its own interests in opposition to that rules-based order, in opposition to a US role, in opposition to alliances, and even in opposition to Japanese leadership, the more Japan has felt this need for itself to be much more proactive internationally to protect its interests. And so it's a really sharp, stark difference than the Cold War and even that brief interregnum after the Cold War as well. Uh, and then there was another factor over the last five years that served to hypercharge that. Uh, and, and that was, of course, concerns about the United States. Uh, under the Trump administration, I don't need to tell anyone watching this from Europe or watching this from Brussels uh, that the former United States president did not understand alliances. He mentally seemed to be incapable of doing that. Um, you know, he was a very zero sum mentality. The notion of win win is just something he could not understand. There had to be an, uh, you know, a winner and a loser, and he had to be the winner. And that's an attitude that does not lend itself well to alliances. And so during his tenure, uh, the degree of tensions between the United States and NATO uh, were, were just shocking to many. And it didn't stop at NATO. It, it extended to South Korea. Uh, it extended to Australia. It extended to Japan. It extended to alliances writ large. And so in an environment where not only did the election of a president like former President Donald Trump shock the 
democracies globally, shock allies globally, but his specific policies and attitudes even further shocked the system. And so what that meant was on the one hand, you already had countries and treaty allies like Japan and Korea and Australia and NATO who were looking at, at oh, how do we respond to this growing Chinese threat to the system, to the rules-based order. And at the same time now, they're dealing with the anxiety of not being able to count on the United States. In fact, you know, uh, dealing with the United States that seemed to be expressly setting about tearing down the international rules-based order that the United States together with Europe and the UK and others had built. Uh, and, and as you might imagine, that meant that the last five years was among the most uncertain, uh, and certainly in my lived lifetime. Uh, and that led to a lot of remarkable activities in this region. So let me now turn and talk about the Indo-Pacific uh, as a region uh, and, and what it means. And here, let me, if you don't mind, I'm going to just step back because I, I know that there now is uh, in a, Euro a European Union Indo-Pacific strategy that Germany and that France and the UK and the Netherlands have all developed their own strategies. But I think there, the interesting thing about the Indo-Pacific is there is no clear definition of what it is. Uh, and I think I should at least outline for you, sitting as I do here in Western Australia, uh, my perception of the Indo-Pacific, because that frames everything else I'm going to be talking about for the rest of my remarks, whether it is the CPTPP, whether it is the Quad, whether it is AUKUS, the G20, or even things on, 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 on uh, Ukraine. So to put the Indo-Pacific in context, when I began my professional career in Washington 30 years ago, not only did no one use the term Indo-Pacific, but no one used the term Asia-Pacific. We generally talked about the Orient, you know, not, not the best of terms these days, right? You know, the exotic Far East, uh, which is funny because looking at it from an American perspective is always West. The Far East is a, a Eurocentric term, as you might imagine. Um, we uh, talked about Northeast Asia. We talked about Southeast Asia and South Asia and Australia, where I sit right now, was floating around in some mystical land called Oceania, right? It's like hanging out next to Atlantis somewhere. It's, it's a, and uh, it really wasn't until the late 1980s when the economic powerhouses of Japan and Korea uh, realized that they needed to, to find both new production bases and markets, and they wanted to integrate Asia South into Southeast Asia, and at the same time, Australia, with this Asian Century White Paper and New Zealand said, hey, look, you know, we can't just exist as these European bubble outposts out here. We've got massive migration from the region. Our future lies on our integration into Asia. And so they wanted to be part of Asia. Uh, and so really, that was the, the merger, if you will, of the you know, Oceania, you know, the Pacific Islands, Australia, New Zealand, uh, with the economies of Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia in the middle. That became the basis of the Asia Pacific. And so for most of my professional career, for 30 years, Asia Pacific was the preferred way to refer to this region. We talked about organizations called the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Initiative, APEC, the Pacific Basin Economic Cooperation Council that talked about Asia Pacific, and countries and companies all had Asia Pacific office, Asia Pacific strategies. Uh, and that was perfectly fine. That served us very well for the better part of 30 years. However, I would note that Asia Pacific itself had no firm definitions as to what country was in and what country was out. There are probably 20 different Asia Pacific organizations with 10, 20 different groupings. Some of them focus on the Pacific Islands. Some of them included the, the West Coast of both North and South America. Some of them did not. Uh, you know, so Asia Pacific itself was a pretty broad, ill-defined term. And about 10 years ago, it became increasingly apparent that there was something missing from the Asia Pacific economic and security architecture. So by then, we had an Asia Pacific security architecture which of course was still based on US hub and spokes alliances, but also had a, a regional element to it for the first time. And that was an ASEAN centrality based 
ASEAN Regional Forum, ADMM Plus Three, those types of organizations, you know, that were really based on Southeast Asia. But what was missing from those organizations and what was missing from organizations like APEC is India. Uh, and, and so on, on my core basic, you know, there today are lots of definitions about what the Indo-Pacific is. You know, Japan, beginning with Prime Minister Abe's speech in India back in 2007, the confluence of two great oceans, their view goes all the way to the east coast of Africa, right? As does the Indian view, of course, with a much more heavy focus on the, the, the western part of the Indian Ocean, right? Whereas, you know, sitting as we do at, in the fulcrum point in the middle of from Australia, we tend to be much more concerned with that diagonal that goes from the Indian Ocean the, up into the Pacific Ocean, the kind of, if you will, the heart are the core of the Indo-Pacific. But it's remarkable to, to understand that when I first heard the term Indo-Pacific, I was in Washington, and I thought it was a silly academic construct that had no utility for foreign policy. Now, why, why would you use the term Indo-Pacific? Because you combine the Pacific Ocean with the Indian Ocean, and the only thing you're missing is the Atlantic. Uh, it's the whole world. You might as well be global. You know, don't bother. Um, but as I said at the outset of these remarks, uh, where you stand depends on where you sit. Uh, sitting here in Western Australia, where we are actually Australia's Indian Ocean capital, and every day I look out on the Indian Ocean, uh, and I recognize that all the energy trade coming from the Middle East and considerable amounts of it now coming up from Western Australia go through the Indian Ocean, up through the Straits of Malacca, up into Asia, that you know, the lines that we drew between South Asia and the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean didn't reflect economic realities or security realities. Very similarly, uh, you will remember the, the horrific events around uh, MH370, the Malaysian airliner, uh, which mysteriously disappeared in the Indian Ocean. The search for that for months was centered out of Western Australia, out of Perth. Australia is kind of the only, Indian, only city uh, on the Indian Ocean littoral that had the capacity to project out into the Indian Ocean and coordinate air and naval and other searches in that region. Uh, and during that time, it was quite remarkable to security planners here, this is eight years ago now, that the Chinese were actively involved in that process, given the number of Chinese on board. Uh, and they were able to maintain a significant Chinese naval presence in the Indian Ocean. So all of a sudden, click, click, the Indian Ocean became a security uh, theater as well, tied to the, the Pacific. The first government official to use the term Indo-Pacific in a government document was actually uh, Stephen Smith, who was then the Minister of Defense. Uh, he's from Western Australia, so that influenced it, in the 2013 Defense White Paper. So it wasn't that long ago, less than a decade ago, nine years ago. Um, his successor, David Johnson, other party, a liberal national party here, so a different side of politics, used the same construct uh, for the 2016 Defense White Paper in Australia. Uh, also, uh, the foreign minister of Australia, Julie Bishop, in 2017, used the term Indo-Pacific as the organizing construct for Australian foreign policy in the foreign policy white paper that year. And then most recently, when Australia, again, under a conservative government, put out the 2020 Defense Strategic Update, where Indo-Pacific was a framing term. Since that time, uh, you know, Japan has had a very proactive uh, Indo-Pacific policy, which they've termed free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, uh, then the ASEANs have had their own Indo-Pacific outlook, uh, which was free, open, and ASEAN centrality-based Indo-Pacific. The Indians have had free, open, and, uh, you know, and, and free, open, and peaceful. I don't, can't remember what the words they use on that, but I remember in 2019 when, when I guess it was 20, 2018 or 2019, when Prime Minister Modi, 2018, Prime Minister Modi delivered the keynote speech at the, um, the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore. I think he used the term Indo-Pacific some 11 times in his remarks. Uh, immediately after that meeting, uh, inked an agreement between India and Indonesia, which was framed as an Indo-Pacific agreement. So that has grown quite dramatically. So why did I tell you that, right? So at its core, the Indo-Pacific is all about how do we incorporate India into the Indo-Pacific. So the question is why? Number one, it begins to recognize on the ground realities, economic realities, 
logistical realities, sea lanes of communication realities, security realities, right? There is no magical line that separates uh, the Indian Ocean from the Pacific Ocean in terms of security, security architecture, right? But there's actually something even more substantive here. Uh, and that is that the emergence of the Indo-Pacific as a construct is itself, in my view, a response to growing concern about the rise of China and the declining influence of the United States. Uh, and so essentially what is happening is leading countries in the region like Japan, like Australia, uh, like India for that matter, are concerned. And so they're looking for like-minded partners. So if you wanna understand it this way, if you look at the Asia Pacific economic and security architecture, as China grew in influence, um, it was increasingly contesting with other parties in the region whether with Japan and Korea and the East China Seas uh, or, or in the South China Seas with almost all of its neighbors down there. Uh, and as China grows in influence in a region, you really have two choices. One, you can try to combat it, which no country wanted to do because they were still benefiting tremendously from their economic interactions with China. Or you can do something a little bit more creative, which is increase the size of the pie. So bringing India into the Indo-Pacific does something which is really important to understand. It dilutes relative Chinese power. It also dilutes relative American power and relative Japanese power, but it, it makes it much more of a multipolar, much more of a rules-based order-based discussion than a, a you know, superpower, great power rivalry kind of construct that, that, that I think um, that I think that China would have liked. So it is not a surprise that Japan has been for the last decade among the most enthusiastic proponents of the Indo-Pacific as an organizing construct. It is not a surprise to me that Australia has been one of the most enthusiastic proponents of the Indo-Pacific construct. And it's not a surprise to me that India has been among the most enthusiastic proponents of the Indo-Pacific as a construct. It is also not a surprise to me that ASEAN is a little bit ambivalent right? because they're ambivalent about everything as we're seeing on Ukraine either right now. But I actually think that they have been slowly coming around because the truth is uh, Indo-Pacific really puts ASEAN square dab in the center. It is the contested space. Uh, so we'll get back to that right now. Now, I I've gone on too long, but I thought Framing that is really important, particularly if you're looking at this from a European perspective. Well, why does Europe have an Indo-Pacific strategy? Why does a country like Australia or Japan welcome, you know, the Germans sending a, 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 a frigate, you know, the Bayern, to visit not only Fremantle, but to go up into the region? Why does Japan and Australia and others in the region welcome the United Kingdom sending a carrier battle group into this region? You know, a, a, there are some in Europe there are some in the United States who have articulated the fact, and this is particular pre-Ukraine, that you know, Europe should take care of itself. Why is Europe bothering paying attention to the Indo-Pacific? You know, they should just take care of Europe uh, and leave this region to the United States. And I could not disagree with that line of argument more because in the end, I believe in the power of complexity. I believe that the more parties that have an active interest in the Indo-Pacific, the more it is not a simple US versus China, mano y mano, you know, great power condominium, you know, new model of superpower relations type of a debate. It, it, is, it is much more about, a, from a, a, an Australian perspective now, a rules-based order. And clearly that's something that Japan agrees with as well, right? They want and welcome an active European involvement here because what does it do? It complicates Chinese decision-making, right? The fact that you know, Europe has a vested interest in this region and a policy towards this region. The fact that ASEAN has a, a view of it and a strategy and that India is here and Japan and Korea are here and Australia is here and Canada is here now, it, it's, it's a good thing. I think you know, it just makes this a much more complicated region. And I think that in the end is, uh, is, is good for our security. And again, recent events, I think probably bear that out as well. So now having gone on for already 30 minutes, 
let me let me take a little bit more and go down very specifically at some of the specific topics I was asked to talk about, because I think I've set the context for them. And I'm going to start out with one that I was not asked to talk about, but I actually think is the most important element uh, in in Japan's leadership, but also it remains the greatest hole in the Indo-Pacific right now, and that is trade. Historically, the Asia Pacific was really all about economic integration, while security lagged behind. You know, so APEC was very proactive. Uh, the free trade agreements throughout the region were progressing, uh, where the security cooperation was nascent and, and relatively ineffective. Ironically, we're kind of in a very different environment right now, where the the lagging era area has been one of trade and economic liberalization, and that is largely due to uh, problems domestically in the United States. So one of the very first things that former U.S. President Donald Trump did when he took office in 2017 was to formally withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, right, or the negotiations that had been concluded at that point. I think uh, I had I had this long list that you know the 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 you know of what was the most self-injurious thing any country could do to their own their own national interest. Uh, I had Brexit on top of that, electing Trump on top of that. Then I had pulling out of the TPP on top of that. I probably would put invading Ukraine on top of that too, in terms of truly self-injurious in behavior. But uh, it is a tremendous own goal on the part of the United States to withdraw itself from this fundamental debate about how trade and economic interaction is organized in the most economically vibrant region in the world. Uh, and myself and most analysts included assumed that with the Trump withdrawal, with Trump's open hostility to trade liberalization, free trade agreements, the internationalization of trade agreements, that the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was dead. And then something happened that nobody appreciates nearly enough. Uh, in the 2017 and then in 2018, Japan, together with Australia, resurrected miraculously the TPP. They called it the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the TPP, CPTPP. It was a tremendous accomplishment to do something like this with no U.S. leadership, and in fact, in the face of U.S. hostility. Remarkable accomplishment. The only problem is because Japan and uh, in Australia were both treaty allies of the United States, and nobody wanted to risk the eye of Sauron or the anger of Donald Trump, they couldn't celebrate it. They couldn't say, look what we did. This is great. It was kind of like, yay, TPP. And they were just very, very quiet about it. And so nobody realizes what a significant agreement that was, holding the door open for the United States, setting a real, real high quality 21st century free trade agreement for the region. Now, unfortunately, uh, U.S. politics is a mess. Uh, the Biden administration in its first year has made zero progress on anything resembling a, a trade or an economic or an investment strategy for the region. Uh, and judging by President Biden's State of the Union speech last night, which was 1930s era protectionism, America first, build, we're going to rebuild our infrastructure and every nail, every screw is going to be made in the United States. I'm worried that the United States has got itself tied up and not still around trade. Uh, and that means that when we talk about the Quad, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, which is great, when we talk about AUKUS, which is a great thing, when we talk about all the other regional kind of mini laterals that, that Dr. Dr. Petsova was talking about, there is something missing. There is a trade and economic size hole in the middle of the Indo-Pacific. This does not include the United States. Uh, on the other hand, you've also got RCEP, which is kind of a bottom-up, lowest common denominator trade rationalization kind of effort where China's in it, but India is not, um, and, and the United States is not as well. Um, there's still no leadership, no vision in that front. And that's a big issue. And the reason I mentioned that in this conversation on security issues is that uh, the last Secretary of Defense under the Obama administration, Ash Carter, once said, the TPP is worth one carrier battle group. 
you know, trade and economic issues have strategic importance. And again, I would note that if you look at the international community's response to Ukraine, you're seeing exactly how important these things are. And so we are one hand tied behind our back uh, in the Indo-Pacific without a trade or an economic thing. So now let me hit some of the other highlights here, right? Any country, um, this is a really important thing to state, has many, many, many tools at its diplomacy to advance its interests. The first is bilateral relations. Uh, and so Japan, the United States, Australia, they all have very robust bilateral relationships. So Japan has a bilateral treaty with the United States, which candidly is its foundation. The bilateral security treaty is the foundation. Similarly, the foundation of Australia's national security is its bilateral alliance with the United States. But then overlaid on top of that is a whole range of other fora in which you cooperate depending on the issue. So obviously Japan is a very important player in the G7. Uh, and the G7 has a very important role to play, particularly since uh, Russia years ago was booted out and the G8, then became the G7, right? It, it is able to speak in a much more effective way. Likewise, the G20 is an important fora uh, for these things. And likewise, you know, more broadly, depending on the issue, where there's APEC, where there's the UN, there's a whole range. There's, there's literally 30 different regional groupings that but Japan, Australia, the United States, all participating depending on the issue. Some of them are rising, you know, some of them are falling. So you have things like the Indian Ocean Rim Association uh, that Japan is an observer at, but a very important role in that, which is not overly important. You have something that I wrote on for a long time, MICTA, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, Australia, middle power grouping within the G20, but as Turkey has kind of completely gone off the page, is no longer relevant or, or, or possible in a meaningful way in that front. So it's, 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 it's dropping in terms of its relevance, its ability to coordinate there. And into this context comes two agreements, which I think are the focus of this discussion. Uh, number one, the Quad, uh, and then number two, the AUKUS. Now the Quad, I think most of you will know, is not new. Uh, it, it really uh, came about after the Boxing Day tsunami back in the mid 2000s. Uh, and it was called the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. It was the US, Japan, Australia, and India cooperating together in response to the Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh, and then later on led to some conversations about refueling, et cetera, but it largely died. Uh, by the time you came around to 2007, 2008, um, most countries, you know, the United States included, Japan included, Australia concluded, we're still very much trying to work together with China. We're worried about offending to China. It was not perceived at that time as an anti-China grouping. Um, and um, Australia actually took the bulk, bulk of the blame. Uh, there was a, a time when the then um, the Australian defense minister, Stephen Smith, I think it was in late 2007, stood next to the then Chinese foreign minister, Yang Jiechir, and said Australia will not be participating in any future quad meetings. And so everybody says, ah, oh, the Australians, they pulled out and they killed the quad. Well, the truth is Japan had said there was gonna be no meetings. India wasn't interested in quad meetings and neither was the United States. And so it, was, it had just kind of died its own death. But going back to what I said at the beginning of my remarks, something has changed, right? Why would Japan, a country that was very ambivalent about doing anything that might offend China and, and, and affect its investments in China, be eager to be a leader in the Quad? Why would India, a country known for its, its non-aligned movement, you know, its desire not to be part of any groupings whatsoever that weren't part of that broad nine but why would they want to be uh, in, in the same grouping with the United States uh, and with Japan uh, and Australia. Well, they had uh, every one of them had growing concerns about the role of China. And in particular, they had growing concerns about uh, the threat that China was posing to the rules based order, particularly in the security front. And so the quad was resumed, but resumed at a relatively low working level. And then, then actually quite organically and quite dynamically grew uh, in, in both relevance uh, and importance. I would highlight several dates. Um, in October of 2020, 
Then U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who, as you might tell from my comments, is not a, a university beloved figure. He remains one of the few American apologists for Putin right now, which is bizarre to me, right? Um, he can, requested that he was going to be visiting Japan on the eve of an election, which is, again, a very sensitive time to be doing it in the United States. So October 2021, weeks before the election. And then despite COVID, despite all the challenges, the Indian Foreign Minister S. Jai Shankar, the Australian Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, you know, and the Japanese Foreign Minister all rushed into Tokyo together and met with Mike Pompeo, despite the fact that no one really likes Mike Pompeo, right? Why would Japan, India, and Australia rush to hug the United States at the tail end of a very controversial antagonistic Trump administration with someone like Mike Pompeo. Why? Because of their shared concern about developments in the region, which is as I outlined at the very beginning. You know, and, and so all of a sudden then with the results of the election and a much more normal mainstream kind of US administration in, in Joe Biden, by March of 2013, you had the first ever quad leaders meeting. It immediately was, was elevated from the foreign minister's level to the leader's meeting, and that was virtual. And then the Quad did something quite remarkable. Even though that it was originally began as a quadrilateral security dialogue, they made it pretty clear that their primary focus was not going to be on hard security. You know, it wasn't going to supplant the hub and spokes alliances. It wasn't going to supplant uh, the, the, the broader bilateral alliances or the other security frameworks, but instead they were going to focus on, on climate change, on pandemic response, on, on supply chain, on cyber, and a bunch of other issues that made it much easier for countries like in Southeast Asia to say, yeah, we think the Quad is doing great stuff, because you really couldn't frame the Quad as being anti-China, because it wasn't doing hard anti-China stuff. It was doing broad communal good, global commons regional commons good work. Uh, and then obviously then we had in September the, the first in-person leaders meeting of the Quad uh, in Washington, DC. I was dumb lucky, I'll explain that later, to be there at that, at that time. And then uh, most recently, just the, uh, last month, we had the, uh, another meeting of the Quad foreign ministers uh, in, 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 um, in Melbourne here in Australia. All of this taking place during the pandemic, it gives you a sense of the priority that uh, has been placed on the quad by the countries. And, and to me, that is not the most, that is the most interesting thing part about this. Truth is, it's not surprising to me at all that Australia supports the quad, right? We're lucky to be in it, right? We're a tiny country, 25 million people, you know, and the other countries have 110 million Japanese, 1.3 billion Chinese, you know, 365 million Americans, big, big economy, then we've got Australia. So Australia, we're joiners, we love things, we're in a very important position, so we're happy to be there, right? It's great. America, of course, this is their interest. What's really interesting is how robust Japanese support for the Quad has been. Uh, and then secondly, even more interesting, is how eager India has been. And that, of course, goes back to India's own anxiety. Uh, their security disputes with China along their own border at Doklam and Ladakh and other things like that. India, like the EU, like Germany, like Japan, like Australia, is looking for partners in an uncertain era. Uh, and that's how I view the Quad. Uh, and I think they've done a great job of framing it that way. Now, last thing I'll touch on uh, is, is AUKUS. Um, um, I, out of just sheer dumb luck, um, at two years of, of, of isolation, not being able to travel, last September, I happened to be in Washington, D.C., the same, the same week as, as the, the Osman ministerial meetings, the announcement of AUKUS, and the Quad Leaders meeting. And since none of my friends in Washington had seen anybody from Australia other than a stray government official for two years, they all assumed that I was there just holding the documents while they got signed. And it was just pure dumb luck that I happened to be there at the same time. But the level of American interest in Australia post AUKUS has gone through the roof, as you might imagine, right? So AUKUS, for those of you who don't know, doesn't formally involve Japan for this Japan-focused conversation, but it's really important to Japan. And what it is at its core 
everybody is focused on submarines, 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 right? Because it's a really big deal that, you know, the United States has agreed together with the UK to provide nuclear submarines to Australia. And obviously, there are probably uh, some of our colleagues from France on there who are still smarting from that decision uh, in terms of the way the Australian government here handled uh, the previous contract they had with France over, over a, a, a diesel-based submarine system. But the, the more important part of, of AUKUS is it essentially upgrades the alliance between uh, Australia and the United States and Australia and the UK in terms of intelligence sharing cooperation. So whereas I mentioned the quad was deliberately set aside as to not be about hard security issues, the AUKUS is, is all about security. It is about military uh, technology sharing, intelligence sharing, equipment, and preparing these three countries for a contested era in the Indo-Pacific. And remarkably, uh, the, one of the, I think the first country to express their support for AUKUS and their desire to cooperate with AUKUS was Japan. Uh, number one, because they recognized that in the technology space, they had an awful lot to offer, but also this is something that Japan welcomed, you know, that they wanted a robust region. This goes back to what I was saying earlier about how you know, complexity in the region is beneficial for the rules-based order. So I think I've kind of laid out for you where I think the region is right now and how things have developed a little bit. The last thing I will end on is uh, a, a note of humility. Um, again, that most of you on the call are going to be far more expert on this than I am, but I have been absolutely um, both horrified and deeply inspired by developments uh, in Ukraine over the last seven days. Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the horrors of a major state invasion of another sovereign state, unprovoked, uh, it, it was just a shock to me, right? It, it literally is something that I kind of thought, I think most people had thought uh, was consigned to another era. Um, none of us can use the term post-war Europe anymore, right? Because that era has been closed. We're, we're back in, in an era where there are major wars in Europe right now. And at the same time, I found this just deeply inspiring. Uh, and I think like many of you, you know, the, the stories coming out of Ukraine, their bravery, the bravery of their political leadership, of their people, um, has not just inspired, obviously, you know, their countrymen, but their continent, uh, the European Union, and the globe writ large. And I never would have imagined how quickly uh, the world would respond. Uh, things that seven days ago I would have thought were impossible have taken place over a weekend. Uh, and so the reason I mentioned that, again, you're more expert in that than me, we can, we can talk about that. But the reason I mentioned that is we now have some long held assumptions about what is possible in Asia, you know, because it takes so long. And I'm not so sure that those hold anymore uh, because we have, again, we're in a very different era where the decisions are very, very stark. And thus far, far is remarkable that, you know, of course, Australia came out immediately uh, in its condemnation and its support for sanctions, but they were followed very closely behind by Japan. Japan, again, a country once cautious is now in every way, shape or form a leader in the international system. Um, and now, again, like on the other issues I was talking about, Southeast Asia, much more ambivalent. And that includes treaty allies like uh, like. Uh, uh, Philippines and Thailand, who are complicated in this process. Uh, South Korea, a week away from a presidential election, has been supportive, but carefully so and quietly so, and only the international community and not taking any leadership role. Again, not a surprise. Um, Indonesia, candidly, has been a disappointment uh, on this regard. And all eyes have turned to India, uh, because I think most of you know India is in a deeply complicated situation. During is long years in, in the wilderness uh, as the United States prioritized an alliance relationship with uh, Pakistan and the United States pursued a very close cooperative relationship with Japan. India relied on, on, on the Soviet Union and then Russia, Russia for decades. It's the bulk of its armaments and its defense you know, program really rely on Russian technology, Russian spare parts. Uh, and so to be very blunt, it's much harder for India to make a quick break uh, 
uh, from Russia than it would be for Japan or it would be for Australia. Now, having said that, one, pressure is growing on India by the day just because of how egregious the actions in, in, in Ukraine are. But secondly, I would add that the, 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 as a way to kind of wrap up my remarks, the fact that we care tells you everything you need to know about the Indo-Pacific. The fact that we care that India has something to say about the Ukraine, that we care that the, the Indonesia should be part of it. We want them on our side. Yeah. We want India on our side. We want them to be more proactive. We want them to be supporting the rules-based order. We want them to condemn activities like uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that tells you how different the world is. You know, a decade ago, I don't know that anybody would have cared, right? Uh, but we do now, and that really marks, I think, a fundamental evolution uh, in, in security in the Indo-Pacific era. So I'm sorry, I, I have talked a little bit longer than I said I would, but I, I think I've put a lot of uh, uh, things on the table, and I look forward to, to a conversation um, uh, both with Dr. Petsova and anybody who might be watching whatever direction you might want to take. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Gordon. This was uh, this was excellent. I think you've uh, given us a, a, a convincing overview and the big picture of where the what are the general trends, uh, what are the stakes, what are the actors. Um, I'm, I'm especially grateful that you actually highlighted the importance of, of trade agreements as, as perhaps one of the missing pillar in in the security architecture in effect actually and um just to complement that there is michael writer who's one of uh, our um who's a senior uh, professor at the vub and, and a former european distinguished european diplomat who just published actually a uh, excellent article on the importance of uh, the trade agreements uh in in the indo-pacific as well so you have the link in the uh, q and r um, the Q&A session is now uh, officially open. Uh, you can uh, post your questions. There's quite a few questions already coming in. Uh, I refraining from from asking the many questions that I would have uh, but you can also use the uh, raise hand function which has now been uh, enabled so um well okay I'll, I'll refrain from my own question I'll leave it uh, at the end but um, focus to uh, on the ones who has been who have been uh, posted Michael writer do you want to uh, perhaps say it uh, out loud or do you want me to read it? Raise hand. No. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll read it then. Um, isn't India underperforming as an ally? And the second question: Quad without ASEAN, so much for ASEAN centrality. Everybody is paying lip service to and without EU. Well, uh, frankly, that was a little bit uh, similar to to my own question on India, because you 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 uh, you've spoken quite a lot, and and in the end, you did mention the problem India is facing, but. Uh, it, it, it is a question, you know, sometimes often actually we, we say that Quad is a problem solving mechanism, that it is not really a strategic alliance against China. But one thing that uh, the Quad members keep saying is that they are like minded partners kind of brought together by these, uh, you know, need to pres preserve the rule of law and, uh, and, and, and the liberal order. Clearly, the um, reluctance of, of India to condemn the Russian uh, invasion um, may be a little bit problematic for the Quad. And that's my kind of uh, follow up question on, on Michael. So in general, is uh, India underperforming and what it means uh, for Quad uh, to, to, to not have ASEAN? Um, and not uh, really work more um, with the EU. Uh, to give you a little bit more time to think about this, I'll read the second question of um, Errol Levy, who is uh, the desk officer actually at the European External Action Service for Japan. Hi, good to see you, Errol. Um, and uh, Errol is asking you to comment uh, on the desirability and prospects for EU and other European uh, engagement with the Quad. So again, it's it's very much uh, connected uh, to the first question. So I'll probably leave it at that. Quad, India, and EU. Well, those are all fantastic questions, uh, and, and I appreciate the chance to kind of address them in turn. 
the first on, uh, isn't India underperforming as an ally? The answer is no, because India is not an ally. Right? This is a really important thing, right? A quad is not an alliance. It is not a NATO. Uh, India is not a treaty security ally with the United States so, or with Australia or with Japan. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier on, the quad itself is deliberately not focused on security areas uh, uh, in terms of that process. Now, uh, India is underperforming as a country. India is underperforming uh, from a humanitarian basis. India is underperforming in, in terms of human rights. India is underperforming as a country that should be vocal uh, in decrying you know, violations of sovereignty. You know, they're, uh, given their own history, uh, are, are very sensitive about questions of sovereignty. Uh, and so in all of those things, Yes, we would like India to be much more proactive, um, much more focused uh, on, on, on you know, condemning uh, Russian actions. But as I mentioned at the outside, it's complicated. The Indian domestic politics are complicated precisely because they are a democracy and precisely because they are deeply concerned in their own security, not about Russia, but about China. Right? And their strategy to defend against China, for which they at this point, because they're not treaty allies of the United States or Japan, they do not yet have confidence that in a conflict with China, say something happened again on the, their border with Ladakh, that they could count on the United States as not a treaty, treaty ally, or uh, Japan or Australia to come to their aid. You know? And so they have to rely upon their own resources. And their own resources right now at this point are fundamentally you know, provided, particularly on the security front, by Russia, right? And so you begin to sense why this isn't quite as, as black and white as it might seem if you're looking at this from an Indian national security perspective. So yes, I would like them to be much more vocal. Most democracies would like them to be much more vocal. Uh, but if you're looking at this from a hard national interest perspective, from a national security perspective, they're much more focused on China than they are in Russia. It's much more of a direct threat uh, and it's complicated. So my view is by all means that we should not make this a litmus test for their participation in the quad. So for example, uh, India, you know, the U US lobbied extremely hard to get India to join uh, in, in its actions in the UN Security Council condemning uh, the Russian invasion. And in the end, we got India to abstain. Huh, that's not great, uh, but we're certainly happy that they abstained rather than joining Russia and voting no, right? In terms of that, right? Uh, and India has been creeping slowly. Remember, it's only seven days, right? <laughs> so, so uh, you know, we we seeing how just mind blindingly fast that Europe has responded can now turn around and say India. Why haven't you done the same thing yet? And, and I, my guess is that there needs to be a little bit more humility. I don't think any one of us uh, seven days ago would have expected Germany to respond as, as robustly as it has. So now that Germany has done that, for us to turn around and expect a, another country whose actually is, its security is far more compromised than, than Germany's energy security was, right? And yet to expect them to take that move with the same rapidity, I think is probably a little bit too far. So I don't know if I've answered the question. They're not underperforming as an ally. Uh, they're probably underperforming as, as a democratic society, as a member of the rules-based order, sisterhood of nation states, yes. Uh, but I think that, that we need to be patient and that should not inhibit uh, their participation in the quad because just because that we, they haven't come fully with us right now doesn't mean we don't wanna work with them. Again, look at the quad agenda. You know, are there any of those issues that you don't want India there on, be it climate chains or supply chains or cyber or, you know, or, you know, COVID response, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I actually just think you just also have to appreciate how far India has come. You know, I just, you know, there's, there's a, there's an element of humility and patience that's required for all of us looking at that. Second question, uh, the quad without ASEAN, or the Quad without EU, you, you are absolutely correct. I, I made the point earlier, and when I was trying to sell the construct of the Indo-Pacific to people in ASEAN, I made the notion that the real loser from the shift between Indo, uh, Asia Pacific uh, 
to Indo-Pacific wasn't ASEAN. In fact, anything, ASEAN's centrality becomes more important. Now, let me rephrase that. Southeast Asia's centrality becomes more important. In other words, the contested space uh, is, is really Southeast Asia in terms of really important, really big growing countries like Indonesia, like Vietnam, like the Philippines, like Thailand, like Malaysia. Those, those are, that's the contested space in this region. And so, you know, the Indo-Pacific really does have at its heart uh, Southeast Asia, not necessarily ASEAN as an organization. Um, as mentioned by Dr. Uh, Reiterer, you know, we, we, of course, continue to pay lip service to ASEAN and then doing their own things. But he also rightly pointed out the notion that the Quad, right, the Quad, you know, does not uh, include ASEAN nor does it pay lip service to ASEAN in the same way the Indo-Pacific does, the East Asia Summit does, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Initiative does, all, the ASEAN Regional Forum does, all of those pay lip service to ASEAN, right? But the thing is, they all still exist. You know, the Quad does not replace APEC, the Quad does not replace the ASEAN Regional Forum, the Quad does not replace uh, the East Asia Summit, all of those continue to exist, and they all work with ASEAN. The Quad really is, you know, a rather bespoke uh, um, um, organization kind of working together. Now, the broader question about Quad EU. Now, by being pedantic here, right? By definition, uh, I'm not a big fa fan of, of, of you know, organizations who are named by numbers because you can't add a, a party to the Quad without it becoming a quint, right? You know, uh, you, you, the Quad is by definition four countries, right? Um, and I probably would like to see it defined more by mission, but even then we immediately run into questions like relative democracy, right? And some of the challenges we're facing. So really this is, is uh, best described as kind of a US, Japan, Australia, India collaborative minilateral in that regard. And they just happen to be very big, very influential, very important countries. Uh, in terms of capability, at least, including Australia, and our ability to kind of push that, 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 that region. Um, so I think you have already seen, and I've participated in three different workshops about Korea uh, participating with the Quad in Quad Plus activities. Uh, and similarly, ASEAN is saying, what about ASEAN working together with the Quad? Uh, and what about you know, the EU working together with the Quad? And my answer, why, why, not, why not Canada? Canada's a member of the G7, right? And the answer to all of them is yes, 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 of course, right? Every one of those would be, but then again, remember the Quad isn't an organization. It doesn't have a secretariat. It really is just basically a, a added level of coordination from these four countries that on these issues, they're like-minded on it. So I can guarantee you that on every single issue on the Quad agenda, Europe is more in line with that than out in line with that. And they would welcome active European participation on infrastructure, on cyber, on pandemics, uh, on, on all the issues they're working on climate change. It's a given, right? So this is just, uh, in fact, if anything, it's a coordinating mechanism for them to work together with Europe on that front, right? Um, so um, again, it may evolve into something beyond that. You know, the challenges of this last week mean it might be a little bit slower than you might think, but I wouldn't oversell what it is how much it is and stuff. And more importantly, I'll just go back to the point is, it is not replacing anything else, right? They all still exist. And every country still has their bilateral relationships and they have their global UN relationships. And in between global UN and bilateral, they have 30 different mechanisms that they will be using depending on the issue, depending on national interest. Um, and, and so there really is no reason for the EU or Korea or ASEAN to be threatened by or feel displaced by the Quad, they ought to be having their own, and they do in many of them, trilateral relationships or European Southeast Asia, separate meetings. So just, that's the part of the panoply. And some of them are gonna work and some of them aren't. So.
Yeah, thank you, Gordon. Um, of course, uh, I agree. And let's uh, not forget that the Quad or cooperation with the Quad is, uh, in fact, explicitly mentioned in the uh, in the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy as well. So uh, indeed, what we see is this you know, flexible engagements and various combinations uh, of, of cooperation that uh, that are happening and will be happening in trilateral, quadrilateral, multilateral, minilateral, whatever basis we, we see. So it's going to be more messy but perhaps hopefully uh, a little bit more efficient as well. Now, we have quite a few more questions and I'll start with the one, um, perhaps more or more general one on Ukraine. Uh, sorry, but that was inevitable. Uh, the effects uh, of the Ukrainian crisis on the Indo-Pacific. So we've seen, you know, perhaps fears of the US um, directing, uh, you know, diverting its interest towards Europe and perhaps disengaging a little bit more from, uh, from Asia, which I not sure that is really uh, going to be the case. We have seen the strengthening uh, position of Japan and also other like-minded countries, uh, with Japan, of course, uh, urging the US to end strategic ambiguity on Taiwan. The parallels with Taiwan uh, is, is, of course, something that um, you know keep kind of emerging in, in the debates uh, when we talk about uh, the Ukrainian invasion. So is there more to be expected uh, as, as the pitfalls of the Ukrainian uh, crisis in the Indo-Pacific? And perhaps one of them, and that's another question from one of our students, would China benefit eventually from the sanctions imposed on, on Russia by forging trade agreements with Russia? Again, fantastic questions. Um, the short answer is, uh, this is fast moving. We don't really know. And again, I have a, a really added dose of humility because one week ago today, I would never have predicted, and I don't know that anybody would predict how rapidly Europe has moved, right? Because we always thought Europe was ossified and slow and bureaucratic, and there's no way in the world that Germany was going to up in 70 years of post-World World War II kind of strategy towards Russia, and those things have happened. So I am, I am open to and aware that there is a potential for dr more dramatic change in um, in in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I appreciate um, Octavian's kind of question, noting that you know all, all of a sudden you know Japan, you know, which has been extremely cautious. Uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe's you know proposals were quite revolutionary, even to suggest nuclear sharing. Right, that's a big deal. Um, his his half brother. The current defense minister, Nobu Kishi, had to come back immediately and kind of walk back that suggestion, say, no, that's not government policy. We're not going there yet uh, in terms of process. But the question is really, really important because how does this region respond to a fundamental change in our assumptions about the rules-based order? All right? How do we how do we reinforce it? And so far, Japan to a lesser and more ambivalent extent, Korea. Singapore, Australia have been very, very vocal in, in their condemnation and in their advocacy for the kind of the rules-based order, if you will. Other countries are still not decided yet, right? So I've already talked about Southeast Asia and India, but in terms of what impact it has on the region, there's two things I think I wanted to address. One, even before the actual invasion, there was a major debate among policy analysts in Washington, D.C., about whether or not Ukraine was a, a distraction or a litmus test. Uh, and, and, and many of them argued, look, Russia is a failed state. It's a, a gas station masquerading as a country. It's not our real priority. Let the Europeans take care of that. Um, you know, we should be putting our resources and our focus against China, China, China. China is the real geostrategic competitor. We cannot be distracted by Europe. For years, we have been sucked into the Middle East, uh, and our blood and treasure has been spoiled there while China has raced it, you know, ahead, uh, and we can't allow ourselves to get sucked back into Europe. The other side said, no, this is a litmus test. This is about the system. This is about everything, um, all of our values, everything we're talking about, you know, the, the post-World War II liberal rules-based order, the liberal international system was built out of the ashes of World War II on European-American cooperation. So if we don't get this right, you know, then all of it doesn't matter. I, even pre-invasion, was on the litmus test side of things, right? So 
yes, I would love to make sure that we don't distract the U.S. attention and resources too much towards that. But uh, in the end, you know, if Ukraine falls and is allowed to fall, to me, the consequences of that action for Asia would be devastating. You know, if Russia were to be successful in its endeavor to invade and essentially erase a sovereign nation state recognized by treaty from the map. You know, can you imagine the credibility of America's you know, position in the rest of the world anywhere? Right? It's just, it's gone, not just America. Now, again, where I'm really encouraged is by, again, the incredible unity of the European response and how Europe has really stepped up in a way that so many skeptics said it never would, right? Both in terms of spending and commitment. And so I, I, I find myself just deeply enheartened uh, by the European response. And so far, other than financial actions, not much has been demanded of the United States. And so, it, uh, I, again, I don't think it has been a distraction. I think it's a litmus test. And so far, so good, although I do appreciate there, there are many hard days ahead. Now, the final, the final area where there's a real question is how it impacts our region really goes back to how it impacts China, and in particular, China-Taiwan. And again, this is a really hard question. Um, it, it's useful to remember that just one month ago, uh, Vladimir Putin was visiting China for the Beijing Olympics. There was this really stunning, and I would argue deeply disturbing, joint statement put out by, by Russia and China saying there was no limits to their cooperation and they were the real kind of norm setters around the world. And we're like, oh my goodness, what does this mean, right? Um, uh, there's a, a lot of argument I've seen from Chinese friend of mine now say in the end that it was China that got played, right? That China has been dragged into this, you know, they, they put their reputation on the line defending Russia. Even the day of the invasion had signed a wheat offtake agreement to take Russian wheat, provide Russian, and now they're being asked to back up Russia when Russia is doing horrible, undefensible things, right? Which are an embarrassment, candidly, to you know, any free thinking Chinese people in the world too, right? I mean, who, who, who really in this day and era, even if you're an ethnic Chinese and very proud nationalist Chinese, do you really support what's happening in Ukraine? And do you want your government to be seen as supporting that, right? Uh, so the same ambivalence and horrors that I think the Russian people who are able to be aware of and understand it without the veil of propaganda, I think is facing China. And so that's going to be a really interesting question. China is put in a very difficult position because, again, their own actions have squandered a decade of democracy, you know, a decade of diplomacy you know, in terms of you know, their economic coercion against Australia last year, their economic coercion in the region, you know, their economic coercion against Finland and then the, you know, the Sweden and all these other countries has meant that Europe has kind of opened up to the Chinese threat even pre-Ukraine. And then now you see China taking a position defending the indefensible. It doesn't advance China's interests at all. This is not good for China. It's not good for their leadership in the world. It's not good for their objectives, for their trade, their commerce. Now, you can argue that, yeah, China can eventually be the bankroll to, to help undermine Western sanctions. But is that really good for China? Is it good for the reputation? Is it good for the, I mean, really, is that their partner? This kind of, you know, the bloodied hands of Putin? That's their partner. That's the image that modern China wants to send to the world. So you can see it's really a two-edged sword for them. And the final thing, I know I'm going too long with my answers. The, the final thing I'll, I'll add on here is the really complicating factor is Taiwan. And that uh, already a lot of, uh, a, a of um, cross-strait China specialists were worried that were the Russians successful in a precipitous manner in Ukraine, that that would have been something that would encourage um, a, a Chinese adventurism on, against Taiwan, right? There's a, there's a sense that time is not on China's side, that every passing day, uh, Taiwan's capabilities grow and the hearts and minds of the Taiwanese people are getting further and further away from China uh, and, and that they, the opportunities for unification are passing them by. And that is just a major priority for the party. And so there was a real sincere worry that China might take advantage of the disruption and the distraction around the Russian invasion of Ukraine to do something themselves cross straits. Um, but I actually think the more interesting question is 
how does the developments in Ukraine impact Taiwan, right? And, and already you're seeing Tsai Ing-wen, the president of Taiwan, you know, offering to donate a month of her own salary to Ukraine relief. You can see in terms of Taiwan's defensive strategies, you know, their, their arms acquisition, their relationships, that it is, you know, <laughs> you don't think uh, it's hardened the, Chinese, the Taiwanese resolve against China and push them further and further away from China? You know, that's interesting, fast moving development there. Don't know the answers, but I think I have a lot of the good questions. Sorry about the long answers. I'll try to keep them shorter. No, there, there's no, there's no long answers. There's just, just answers, and this is, this is fascinating. I mean, just you know, I, I feel tempted to get back a little bit to what you said on China, because uh, and on the importance for China to build a positive international image from this. Uh, we noticed what is it two days ago? The uh, Chinese foreign minister called up its uh, Ukrainian uh, counterpart to uh, offer uh, eventually Chinese mediation of the Ukrainian-Russian uh, conflict. And I find that particular move uh, extremely smart, of course, uh, on the side of, of Beijing. And I was wondering what would your view be of uh, the, let's say, US position on this? Would the US support such Chinese role? Because clearly, I mean, that suddenly, you know, China would move from uh, the villain to uh, a major contributor uh, to, uh, to 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 international peace, so we see that perhaps Russia would, you know, we, we, of course we don't know. But I was just wondering, just to speculate a yeah. little bit on that, and, uh, and a follow honest. up. Yeah, Go sorry, ahead. and a follow up question on Taiwan as well. I mean, to what extent we are? I mean, of course, Taiwan is carefully watching, not just Taiwan, but all the regional actors are are, are carefully watching what the what the U.S. what the Western reaction will be. Um, and, and taking notes, learning lessons and whatever. Um, what do you think if really things comes to worse? And here we're talking about not a legally recognized state, of course. Uh, what would be the immediate uh, reaction or who would really take the lead if things get sour uh, in a kind of Ukrainian type of, uh, of speed uh, in, in the Straits of Taiwan? Um, again, really, really good questions. The first one I'll be very blunt on. I mean, the proposal of Chinese mediation is a joke uh, and it should be regarded as a joke, right? I mean, so yeah, here Russia has come up uh, and visited China. They, they, they basically tied themselves very closely together just a month prior where they say their cooperation and love and brotherhood knows no bounds. And then the very next month, China comes in after basically refusing to criticize Russia, you know, yeah, 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 and says, oh, we'll be a mediator. <laughs> you know, so yeah, there, there is a scenario in which I can see Russia thinking that's good. There's no scenario in which I think Ukraine would see that good. Just think, just think for a second about two days ago, that moving speech that, that uh, President Zelensky gave to the, the European Union, right? <laughs> that he would turn around and say to China, and say, oh, would you please come in and, and be our advocate or at least be a, a, an honest broker mediator in this process? Not a chance in the world. I mean, to be honest, Belarus is probably even better prepared than that in terms of that process. And they're completely character, I mean, compromised in that process. Um, but having said that, I, I actually fully anticipate that in the coming weeks and months, that China will continue to try to distance itself from Russia, particularly uh, as we have seen in the last two days, when Russians' actions have moved from a military exercise, you know, to just wanton destruction of universities and civilians and civilian architectures. I mean, the horrors of what Russia has done for the last 48 hours are going to get worse and worse, and they will become increasingly indefensible, right? Uh, and China can shield its people from that information to a degree, but what they cannot shield is the world from that information and the knowledge that China at a, at, a, at a minimum is turning a blind eye to it, if not actively supporting it. And so every step that China takes, whether it is to buy Russian wheat or to buy Russian oil or to provide financial markets for Russia, it will be seen as an endorsement of the worst excesses that Vladimir Putin is doing right now. And again, I don't know how you get away from that. And that's not just Europeans, that's Asians, that's Southeast Asians, 
that's you know south americans etc and so everybody right now is saying oh my goodness i can't believe ASEAN hasn't come along yet and oh i can't believe india hasn't come along and why aren't we hearing more from paraguay right you know i'm mean, giving a little bit of time right this, we're seven days into this you know and the the the, the more the narrative of what has happened and then happening becomes clear the more indefensible i think chinese positions uh, will be on that front um the the broader question of 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 uh, I think I missed the second part of the question. What was the second part of the question about Taiwan specifically? Oh, never mind. There's actually, well, it was, you know, but that would, I think, uh, bring us way too far. And, you know, we could speculate actually uh, about right. Taiwan for uh, for a very long time over coffee. Unfortunately, that's that we can't do that. And we only have, what, 10 minutes left. And there's, uh, well, actually three more questions, um, which uh, bring us a little bit further away from China for a change and back to India. Um, can you see India entering um, in a more or changing basically its position and entering a more enduring alliance relationship with the US or uh, and the Western alliance system? Uh, or uh, will it stay in the current trajectory? But that's something that you already alluded to actually in your um, uh, in your previous answer. And as final two on New Zealand, was New Zealand was uh, was New Zealand consulted or asked to join AUKUS, especially because it is part of the five buyers uh, arrangement? And what happened to Canada's involvement in the Indo-Pacific? <laughs> like the Canada question, because it seems that at least until recently, the EU and Canadians. European and, and Canadians were always taken in the same pair. You know, we always find uh, ourselves somehow at the margins of the of the regional security architecture. At the, as in regional forum, we struggle to get to the East Asia Summit. We struggle to be taken seriously. So yes, the the role of Canada um, in um, in the Indo Pacific, New Zealand, Canada, and India moving forward or not. Really good questions, and I'll, I'll try to be brief on both these. On, on India, uh, where there's a potential alliance, I mean, I, I think that's unlikely, uh, in, given India's lived experience. You know, they have had, um, you know, a, a centuries-long rough experience with European colonialism in terms of what the British did to them, uh, and they've had a really um, difficult time during the coast the, the post-World War II era of independence and just digging themselves out of that hole that they found themselves in. But there's no question that they're moving more towards um, um, you know, what we would call the democratic world or the West in one way or the other. And, and my own view applies to both India and Indonesia as well. Rather than try to shame them for their ambivalence about what's happening in Ukraine right now, we ought to do everything we can to continue to entice them in our direction to win them, right? Yeah, and, and so right now, you know, uh, Indonesia is afraid because they've just got forty-five billion dollars in in Russian contracts for palm oil, uh, and Europeans and Australians and Americans won't buy the palm oil coming out of Indonesia because it's it's responsible for deforestation and climate change. And so we look at Indonesia and we say, bad, 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 Indonesia. We're not going to buy your dirty palm oil. And the Russians say, sure, we will. So Indonesia says, oh, uh, the Russians are, you know, they don't condemn us and they're open and they're an important partner. So we've got to figure out ways to, to in, you know, continue to work closely to make it clear to Indonesia the benefits of, of, of working in a rules-based order economically, which goes back to my earlier point. We need an economic strategy, right? We have to have some carrots in this process as well. And when it goes to India already, you're seeing some just historic defense cooperation between uh, the United States and India. You're also seeing Japan playing a very important role in terms of India's infrastructure. There's an awful lot more that Japan, the EU, Canada, the United States, France has been very proactive in this front, could be to not just shame India away from Russia, but to pull them away, give them something better. You know, India doesn't have Russian defense platforms because they like it. They did it because that was all that was available to them during those long years of the Cold War where they were kind of non-aligned and America was a close ally with, with Pakistan and not willing to sell these things to India, right? So, or they weren't willing to buy them. It's more complex than that. I get it, right? But anyway, I, I, I would just advocate for some enticement. Uh, New Zealand, again, again, Jacinta Ardern has come across as, as one of the most um, 
I would say, enlightened and, and courageous international leaders in the last you know, four or five years. Uh, she gave a remarkable speech again yes, yesterday that I'd commend to everybody. But it's important to recognize that New Zealand is in a different position than Australia. They are no longer a formal party to the ANZUS Treaty. Uh, so New Zealand is not a treaty ally of the United States. So you remember a minute ago when I listed the treaty allies, Japan, Korea, Thailand, Philippines, and Australia, I did not list New Zealand. So New Zealand remains part of the five eyes in terms of intelligence sharing and cooperation, but New Zealand made some decisions in the 1980s to ban all US nuclear submarines, et cetera, anything with nuclear weapons, uh, and they withdrew from the ANZUS Treaty. Uh, and so as a result, New Zealand's not there. But again, again, I don't want it to diminish New Zealand. Uh, you know they're a very important partner, and they will continue to be a partner. But you know there's it, you know they wouldn't be part of AUKUS because they're not part of that same uh, alliance, and they don't have those same capabilities. They're small. Remember, New Zealand is five million people. Uh, so it, as small as Australia is, it's even smaller still in terms of capabilities and what they bring to the party. Uh, and and really, um, again, if you're talking about a country that banned uh, the U.S. Navy from visiting New Zealand because they're nuclear submarines. Uh, the, the, the notion that they would come on board to have nuclear submarines themselves, which is as part of the heart of AUKUS, is, is, is something I think is a step too far. But that doesn't mean they're less important. It just means they, they cooperate in different fora, uh, and, and they continue to do so in the Five Eyes. Canada is a really interesting question. You know, my mom's Canadian, uh, and, and you'd think I would spend a lot more time thinking about Canada, but Canada suffers. At the beginning of this, we were talking about the tyranny of distance and the tyranny of proximity. Uh, Canada suffers from the tyranny of proximity to the United States. It's right next door to the United States, right? And so U.S. defense is Canadian defense. There's really probably no two closer countries than Canada and the U.S. in security issues. But that just means that Canada's primary responsibilities have not been in the region. They've also obviously been, like the United States and most countries, heavily focused on Chinese markets for their, for their energy, for their wheat, for their agricultural products, et cetera. Uh, but Canada has not had nearly as a proactive an Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific strategy as other countries have had, again, by dint of population and geography. You know, Canada's number one market, their number one economic partner is the United States. You know, it's not this region over here. Uh, whereas Australia, you know, Australia, again, I think Australia, I'm, again, I'm an Aussie now, I think Australia is an amazing country. Uh, with it, despite a tiny population the size of Taiwan, right? We've got global reach and global influence, and we're in the quad and we're in AUKUS, right? But we're still tiny, right? We really have you know, this strategic uh, geography where you cannot have a meaningful Indo Pacific strategy without Australia, just because of its reach, its influence, its capabilities, its knowledge and networks in Southeast Asia, and its own capabilities. But it's not our size not the size of our economy, not the size of our military that kind of put us in that, in that context. Uh, and so Canada Canada's bigger than Australia. You know, slightly larger population, slightly larger economy, just a little bit. But Canada's in the G7. Australia's not, right? Canada was part of that original, much more Atlantic-focused uh, thing, whereas you know, Australia is front and center for any Indo-Pacific strategy. So by dint of history and geography, Canada is much more Euro-focused. Australia is the center of the Indo-Pacific, and I'm sure I'll get some hate mail from some Canadians for me being so blunt, but that's kind of how I view it. So. Okay, Gordon. Um, well, we have reached almost uh, the 90 minutes that we had uh, together, and I, in a way, find that ending up with, with New Zealand and, and Canada is, is not a bad thing, because it's one of those uh, actors that force us uh, and, and, you know, make us realize that how useful it can be to zoom out a little bit and think and consider new different actors and different approaches, and not just to be stuck in the kind of uh, usual prisms. And perhaps what we see, uh, well, with the, with the terrible situation, Situation in, in Ukraine and the, the reaction that Europe had um, is, is one example of this, that a actor that from the Indo-Pacific perspective, at least, was always considered as, as pretty much an underdog, you know, as the distant trading partner that should not be really taken seriously. But suddenly, 
uh, even the most uh, the, the the worst critics of the European Union could see that uh, it could be uh, a powerful actor, and that it's uh, far from you know uh, to be neglected, including in traditional security terms. Because uh, when crisis arrives, we we really do need all of those powers. Well, on that note, uh, I would like to thank so much Gordon for spending you know a long time with us, despite the circumstances, or even perhaps because of the circumstances it's been a pleasure uh, to have you uh, we wish you a very very good evening to Perth uh, the bubble of the bubbles and uh, enjoy the uh, summer uh, I guess because we're all uh, you know suffering in the in kind of not just the doom and gloom of the of um, of the war proximity but also the the winter um thank you so much for joining us uh, to all of you who listen to us uh, more regularly there will be a next public lecture in just two weeks time on the 17th of march on southeast asia uh, by Professor Mie Oba. So I look forward to uh, seeing you all uh, and perhaps more of us. Uh, stay tuned uh, and do not uh, hesitate to follow us on a YouTube channel and on Twitter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gordon, and uh, have you. a great day. It's a great honor. I appreciate it all. Thank you. Bye bye.